Hello friends, welcome to Engineering Chemistry. Today we are learning water and its treatment. As we know that there are two types of water, soft water which produces lather with the soap easily and the other is called as hard water which produces curd or it is also called as precipitate when it reacts with the soap. It produces very little lather so therefore it is called as hard water. So hardness of water is defined as soap consuming capacity. So soap is nothing but the salts of stearic acid, palmitic acid, oleic acid etc. So here we have taken the example of uh, sodium stearate. So sodium stearate which is nothing but a soap when it reacts with the hard water Hard water which basically contains calcium or magnesium ions. So instead of forming lather, it gives white precipitate which is called as calcium stearate. So it is consuming the soap. Hence hardness of water is nothing but soap consuming capacity. So what is the difference between hard water and soft water? So hard water is the one which does not produce lather. It forms a precipitate or curd. Second, it contains dissolved salts of calcium and magnesium. Then it affects the cleansing ability of the soap. Then due to the presence of uh, calcium and magnesium ions, as we have already learned what is meant by colligative properties. So boiling point of the water gets elevated. It is not safe for drinking and it is also not suitable for industrial use. Next we go to the hardness. As we know that hardness is the soap consuming capacity. Hardness is divided into two parts. One is called as temporary hardness and the other is called as permanent hardness. So temporary hardness is due to the carbonate and bicarbonates of calcium and magnesium present in water and permanent hardness is due to the chloride, sulfates or nitrates of calcium and magnesium. So this is very important for the numericals. Next difference is it is temporary hardness is also called as carbonate hardness whereas permanent hardness is also called as non-carbonate hardness as it doesn't contain any carbonates. Carbonates are basic in nature therefore Temporary hardness is also called as alkaline hardness whereas permanent hardness is called as non-alkaline hardness. Temporary hardness can be removed by boiling whereas permanent hardness cannot be removed by boiling. Temporary hardness leads to the formation of loose deposits of carbonates and hydroxides of calcium and magnesium whereas permanent hardness leads to the formation of adherent scales. So this is the reaction for example calcium bicarbonate, magnesium bicarbonate when it is uh, boiled it gives calcium carbonate, magnesium carbonate, magnesium hydroxide precipitates it can be filtered whereas permanent hardness can be removed by addition of calcium hydroxide or sodium carbonate which is nothing but lime and soda so it will give a precipitate hence it cannot be removed by boiling we have to add certain chemical next is degree of hardness Degree of hardness is commonly defined as total quantity of hardness causing salts present in water. It is always determined in terms of calcium carbonate because there are two reasons. First is molecular weight of calcium carbonate is 100 and equivalent weight is 50. So calculation becomes easy. Second is it is highly insoluble in water and it is easily precipitated out. It is always calculated in terms of equivalent of calcium carbonate by using the following formula. Weight of hardness producing substance into chemical equivalent of calcium carbonate that is 50 divided by chemical equivalent of hardness producing substance. The other formula which is commonly used in the numerical is weight of hardness producing substance into molecular weight of calcium carbonate which is 100 uh, divided by molecular weight of hardness producing substance. Now the molecular weight of calcium carbonate upon molecular weight of hardness producing substance is called as multiplication factor. Next we move to the units of hardness. The first unit is ppm. 1 ppm is equal to 1 part by weight of calcium carbonate equivalent divided by 10 raised to 6 parts by weight of water. Second unit is 1 milligram per liter. 1 milligram of calcium carbonate equivalent divided by liters of water. Now what is the relation between ppm and milligram per liter? It is 1 ppm is equal to 1 milligram per liter. We move to the numerical. The numerical is calculate the hardness of given sample of water containing following dissolved salts per liter. Calcium sulfate 15.2 milligram per liter. Magnesium bicarbonate 2.4 milligram per liter. Magnesium chloride 8.5 milligram per liter. Now to solve this numerical, first step is calculation of calcium carbonate equivalent. For this, we will have to make one table. The first column is 
constituents second is quantity third is molecular weight multiplication factor and fifth is calcium carbonate equivalent so first we will calculate for calcium sulfate so quantity is 15.2 molecular weight calcium is 40 sulfur is 32 oxygen is 16 so total becomes 136 multiplication factor becomes 100 upon 136 100 is the molecular weight of calcium carbonate so which is 100 so 100 upon 136 and calcium carbonate equivalent is calculated as 11.17 milligram per liter similarly it is also calculated for magnesium bicarbonate and magnesium chloride next step is calculation of temporary hardness so we now remember that temporary hardness is due to the carbonates and bicarbonates among these three only magnesium bicarbonate is present so therefore temporary hardness is equal to 1.64 milligram per liter step 3 permanent hardness permanent hardness is due to the sulfates chlorides and nitrates among these three first and third is the permanent hardness so total becomes 20.11 and total hardness is the temporary plus permanent so is equal to 21.75 milligram per liter these are the problems for practice and these are the particular answers next step is estimation of hardness of water this method is called as EDTA method. We know that the full form of EDTA is ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. This method is also called as complexometric method because this method involves formation of complex of EDTA and calcium or magnesium. Now in this method what we will do is we will take 50 ml of hard water sample to that we will add buffer. What is buffer? It is the solution which registers the change in pH. Now to the same solution we will add aerochrome black tea which is a blue color dye. Once we add aerochrome black tea it forms metal EVT unstable complex which is wine red in color. Once we get this complex now the same solution will be titrated against EDTA which is in burette. So when we will titrate the metal EVT complex with EDTA. EDTA being a strong ligand, EDTA will replace EBT and it will form metal EDTA complex which is more stable complex and is colorless. At the same time it will release EBT dye which is blue in color. So therefore end point will be wine red to blue in color. Once we get the end point that will be the reading. So for this method we will have to do three titrations. So various steps involved are preparation of standard hard water. Standard hard water is prepared by dissolving 1 gram of calcium carbonate in 1 liter of water. We know that calcium carbonate is completely insoluble in water. Therefore to dissolve it we add little quantity of HCl so that calcium carbonate turns into calcium chloride and gets soluble in water. Second step is standardization of EDTA. Third step is titration of sample of hard water. And the last step is titration of boiled hard water. We know that in case of boiled hard water, temporary hardness is removed. So whatever is remaining is just a permanent hardness. In all these steps, we have to first remember is the standard hard water, which is prepared by 1 gram of calcium carbonate dissolved in 1 liter of water. So for the calculation part, we have got three titrations. So first titration is nothing but 50 ml of standard hard water. Standard hard water is the water for which we have to determine the strength. So 50 ml of standard hard water corresponds to V1 ml of EDTA. 50 ml of sample hard water corresponds to V2 ml of EDTA and 50 ml of boiled hard water corresponds to V3 ml of EDTA solution. So in all we have carried out three titrations of 50 ml of each. First contains 50 ml of standard hard water, second contains 50 ml of sample hard water and third contains 50 ml of boiled hard water. All three solutions we have added buffer solution and also EPT and therefore we have got three readings so that is V1, V2, V3 ml that can be 15 ml, 25 ml, 35 ml and or whatever. So using these three readings we have to calculate the total hardness, temporary hardness and permanent hardness. So first step is determination of strength of EDTA. So for the determination of strength of EDTA we have used first equation. So for the determination of strength of EDTA, we have to calculate from the standard hard water. We know that standard hard water is prepared by 1 gram of calcium carbonate dissolved in 1 liter of water. So I can say 
1 mg dissolved in 1 ml of standard R water. So we have pipetted out 50 ml, therefore 50 ml corresponds to 50 mg of calcium carbonate. But from the above equation, we can say that 50 ml of standard hard water corresponds to V1 ml of EDTS. Therefore, from 1 and 2, we can say that V1 ml of EDTS solution corresponds to 50 mg of calcium carbonate. Therefore, 1 ml of EDTA corresponds to 50 divided by V1 mg of calcium carbonate equivalent. That is nothing but the strength of EDTA solution. Now, in the next step, we have to determine the total hardness. For the second titration, we have taken 50 ml of sample of hard water for which we have got V2 ml of EDTA solution that is the reading of the burette. The value of 1 ml of EDTA is 50 by V1. Therefore, for V2 ml, it will be 50 by V1 into V2. So from third and fourth, we can say that 50 ml of sample hard water is equal to 50 into V2 divided by V1. So now this is the calculation for 50 ml of sample hard water. We want for 1000 ml because the unit of hardness is ppm that is parts per million. So therefore we will just cross multiply and will calculate V2 into 1000 divided by V1. So this is the total hardness. In the similar steps we will calculate the permanent hardness. So for permanent hardness we have to use third reading that is V3. So 1 ml corresponds to 50 by V1 therefore V3 corresponds to 50 by V1 into V3. From 5th and 6th equation we can say that 50 ml of boiled hard water can corresponds to 50 by V1 into V3. Therefore 1000 ml corresponds to V3 into 1000 by V1. So this is the permanent hardness and now the remaining is the temporary hardness that is nothing but total hardness minus permanent hardness corresponds to 1000 into V2 minus V3 divided by V1. So these are the problems for the practice. These are the corresponding answers. In case of problems, you have to remember that we have to use all the steps which are shown in the calculation. You cannot use directly the final formula and calculate. Otherwise, the answers will go wrong. In case if you don't find the answers, these are the solutions for the problems. We have to remember that in this problem, V1 is 20 ml, V2 is 25 ml, V3 is 15 ml. So we have calculated in the similar fashion. So problem 2 is little difficult. So in case of problem 2, V1 is V28, V2 is 33, V3 is 10 ml. But here you have to remember that we have pipetted out 100 ml instead of 50 ml. So therefore we will calculate 100 ml of standard hard water corresponds to 28 mg of. So, so value of 1 ml of DTA is 1 mg. Therefore 33 ml corresponds to 33 ml and therefore 1000 ml will be 330 ppm. So therefore 1000 ml of sample hard water will be 330 ppm is the answer. In the same way permanent hardness will be 100 ppm and temporary will be 230 ppm. Next step is softening of water. The first process which is involved is called as lime soda process. The principle involved in this process is to convert soluble hardness causing impurities into insoluble precipitates by adding calculated quantities of lime and washing soda. The precipitate which is formed by addition of lime and soda will be removed by filtration and hence the hardness causing impurities are removed from the water. Before going to the process, we have to understand the reaction which occur when lime and soda is added. So we will take constituents, the respective reaction and the amount of lime and soda. First constituent is calcium bicarbonate. So when we add one molecule of lime, it gets converted to insoluble calcium carbonate. Thus we require one molecule of lime. The second constituent is magnesium bicarbonate. In this case, we require two molecules of lime. That is in the first reaction, magnesium carbonate is formed which on reaction with calcium hydroxide, it gives magnesium hydroxide and precipitate of calcium carbonate. So total we require two molecules of lime. Third constituent is magnesium chloride. Magnesium chloride requires one molecule of lime and one molecule of soda. So total we require L plus S. So before deciding which constituent is required, we have to look for the insoluble compounds. For example, calcium has insoluble compound as calcium carbonate. Magnesium has insoluble compound as magnesium hydroxide. Iron has insoluble compound as iron hydroxide. 
aluminum has aloh thrice in the same way depending upon the insoluble compounds we have to decide whether we have to add lime or soda so the next constituent is calcium chloride it is obvious that we have to convert the calcium into calcium carbonate therefore we will add soda we require one molecule of soda next is sodium bicarbonate sodium bicarbonate reacts with calcium hydroxide to give calcium carbonate plus one molecule of soda therefore we will require plus l minus s in this reaction soda is produced in the product therefore we have taken as minus s next is carbon dioxide as the water consists of some gases also we will have the reaction of carbon dioxide so in this case we require one molecule of lime similarly for h2s also we will require one molecule of lime next is the acids first acid is hcl in case of hcl the calcium hydroxide is added so that the chlorine gets converted to calcium chloride and then calcium chloride is removed by addition of soda so total we require l plus s next is h2so4 in the same way we will require l plus s next constituent is feso4 feso4 on the addition of calcium hydroxide will get converted to calcium sulfate feoh twice FeOH twice will react with one molecule of water and oxygen present in water to give FeOH thrice whereas calcium sulfate will react with one molecule of soda to give calcium carbonate and sodium sulfate so total we require L plus S next is aluminum sulfate again we have to think in such a way that aluminum will get converted to its precipitate that is AlOH thrice so again we will have to add calcium hydroxide so it forms aloh thrice and calcium sulfate calcium sulfate on treating with soda it will give calcium carbonate so total we will require l plus s the last is sodium aluminate it reacts with water to give aloh thrice which is a precipitate and the sodium hydroxide thus formed reacts with calcium bicarbonate to give calcium carbonate and sodium carbonate here soda is produced in the product therefore it will be minus s at the same time NaOH which is produced in the first reaction consumes one molecule of calcium bicarbonate otherwise this molecule of calcium bicarbonate would have required one molecule of lime so it is consuming one molecule of calcium hydroxide which will require one molecule of lime hence it will be minus l and minus s next is lime soda method in case of lime soda method there are two methods cold lime soda method and hot lime soda method in case of cold lime soda method the first process is batch process in batch process raw water is added from one inlet and from the other inlet lime soda and coagulant is added the role of coagulant is to gather the precipitate and settle it to the bottom these two are mixed with the help of stirrer motor after some time the reaction is stopped and the precipitate is allowed to settle at the bottom from the bottom the precipitate is removed as a sludge from the outlet from the other outlet the softened water is removed through filter bed generally there are two cement concrete tanks which are constructed side by side and which are used alternatively the residual hardness obtained is around 30 to 50 ppm residual hardness is the hardness which remains even after the treatment of water batch process is a time consuming process so this is the major drawback of batch process hence next process is continuous process in continuous process the raw water is taken from one inlet whereas lime soda and coagulant is added continuously from the other inlet these two are mixed with the help of belt drive and the sludge which is formed settles at the bottom quickly the soft water rises up and gets collected into the coaxial chamber from where it is removed the wood fiber filter is placed at one third height to remove the suspended particles the residual hardness obtained is again 30 to 50 ppm the shortcomings of cold lime soda method it is time consuming then low residual hardness third slow reaction all these shortcomings are overcome in hot lime soda process in case of hot lime soda process it consists of three parts conical sedimentation tank reaction chamber and wood fiber filter which is not shown in the diagram raw water is taken from one inlet lime and soda is added from the other inlet and 
high pressure steam is introduced from the other inlet. All the shortcomings of the cool lime soda method is overcome by taking out the reaction at high temperature that is around 80 to 120 degrees Celsius. These three are properly mixed with the help of conical sedimentation tank and the sludge is allowed to settle at the bottom which is removed from the bottom. Soft water rises up and, and it is removed with the help of outlet. As the reaction is carried out at higher temperature, therefore there is no need of coagulant. At higher temperature also, the precipitate which is formed is quickly settled at the bottom. The residual hardness obtained is 15 to 30 ppm. Now we have to move to the numericals. There are some hints which we have to remember. First is, all the substances causing hardness should be always converted to respective calcium carbonate equivalents. This we have already done it. Second is, there are some substances like KCl, NaCl, KNO3, SiO2 or silica, sodium sulphate, potassium sulphate, Fe2O3, organic matter. We have to remember that these are just salts or the substances which are not soluble in water. Therefore, they should not be considered while calculations. If the impurities are given as calcium carbonate, magnesium carbonate, we have to consider it as they are due to the calcium bicarbonate or magnesium bicarbonate. Hence, we have to consider it as a temporary hardness. Next is formula for lime and soda numericals. Formula for lime is 74 upon 100. 74 is the molecular weight of lime. That is CaOH twice. Calcium is 40. Hydrogen is 1. Oxygen is 16 into temporary calcium hardness that is the hardness causing substances such as calcium bicarbonate then temporary magnesium hardness that is magnesium bicarbonate or magnesium carbonate permanent magnesium hardness that is MgCl2, MgSO4 etc. Then gases like CO2, acids HCl, H2SO4, HCO3- minus, salts of Fe2+, plus, Al3 plus etc. and minus NaAlO2 that is sodium aluminate. We have to remember that in case of sodium aluminate we have it is minus L minus S. So therefore we have considered it minus. Into liters of water upon 10 raised to 6 into 100 upon percentage purity. Percentage purity will be given in the numerical. If it is not given we have to consider it as 100. In the bracket, whatever the things are mentioned are all those compounds where the lime is required. So we have to take all the impurities which are given in the numericals. In the same way, soda is also calculated. So here in the bracket, only those impurities are mentioned where soda is required for the treatment. These are the numericals for practice. For example, I have given the solution of problem 1. Calculate the quantity of lime and soda required to soften 20,000 liters of water containing the following salts. The salts are given. Assume that the purity of lime as 90% and that of soda is 95%. Let's go to the solution. We have to make the table as we have made it before. Constituents, quantity in milligram per liter, molecular weight, multiplication factor, CaCO3 equivalent and the additional column is L and S which we have done it for the reactions. So first is calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate we have to consider due to calcium bicarbonate. So it is temporary hardness. The quantity is given molecular weight is 100. So multiplication factor will be 100 upon 100 and CaCO3 equivalent will be 10. In the same fashion we have to consider for the others. Silica and KCl are not the impurities. They can be just filtered or KCl can be obtained by evaporating the water. Therefore we have to write does not contribute to hardness. Hence to be ignored. Now we have calculated L and S molecules which are required. So we can see that there are three impurities where lime is required and there are two impurities where soda is required. According to that we have to write the formula. Lime required in kg. So this will be the formula for the lime required in kg. You have to remember that the final answer will be in kilograms. So in this way we have to substitute the values and finally the answer is 0.575 kilograms. In the same fashion we have to write the formula for soda and then the calculation. So 0.334 kilograms is the answer. Next we move to the zeolite or permuted method of softening. Zeolites are natural or synthetic complex compounds or it is also called as hydrated sodium aluminium silicate. They are also called as green sand because of the natural color of the zeolite. Now we will see the zeolite method. First we have to see the principle. 
Zeolite consists of loosely held sodium ions which are replaced by calcium and magnesium ions present in hard water. The formula of zeolite is Na2O, Al2O3, XSiO2, YH2O. So they are also abbreviated as Na2Z. So we can see that from the abbreviation they have loosely held sodium ions and calcium is stronger than sodium ion therefore calcium will replace sodium and that is how the calcium and magnesium will get adsorbed on the zeolite whereas the water will get free from calcium and magnesium. Now this is the diagram for the zeolite method. The hard water is taken from the one inlet. Now this hard water is allowed to percolate through zeolite bed. During this process as you can see in the reaction Na2Z plus calcium bicarbonate gives 2 NaHCO3 plus calcium zeolite. So calcium is adsorbed on the zeolite bed and the soft water is removed from the bottom. In this way all the other impurities are also get replaced by sodium ions. After some time the zeolite bed get exhausted therefore it has to be regenerated. So for the regeneration purpose we add brine solution from the top. Brine solution is the solution which contains 10% NaCl. This solution is allowed to percolate through zeolite bed. During this process the reverse reaction takes place. Calcium ion will replace sodium ion and therefore the Na2Z that is the zeolite is regenerated. There are some limitations of zeolite process. For example the first is if the water contains manganese or Fe ions these are very strong ions so therefore they replace sodium ions permanently. Such permitted or zeolite cannot be regenerated easily. The second is hard water containing mineral acids. The zeolite bed gets dissolved in acids. So therefore they must be neutralized with soda in advance then only they can be treated with zeolite method. If the hard water contains turbidity this turbidity will permanently block the zeolite pores. Therefore we have to take care that the water should not contain turbidity. The water to be softened should not be hot as zeolite beds get dissolved in it. Now we have to see the advantages. The water which is obtained the residual hardness is 10 ppm. Second is the equipment is compact and occupies less space. No impurities are precipitated in the process therefore it is clean in use. The process automatically adjusts itself different values of hardness of incoming water. Then time consuming for the softening is less and it is easy to regenerate the zeolite bed. These are the numericals for practice. Let's see the solution. The hardness of 4500 liters of water was removed completely by zeolite softeners. The zeolite had required 30 liters of 100 gram per liter that is 1000 milligram per ml of NaCl to regenerate. Calculate the hardness of water. So in this numerical we have to remember that the zeolite had required 30 liters of 100 gram per liter. So 1 liter of NaCl consists of 100 gram per liter. Okay, so in the case of solution also we will write in the same fashion. 1 liter of NaCl solution contains 100 gram. We require 30 liters. So therefore 30 liter of NaCl will, con will require 30 into 100 that is 3000 gram of NaCl. We have to remember one equation. Here we are comparing NaCl with calcium carbonate. So 58.5 gram that is equivalent weight of NaCl is equal to 50 gram of CaCO3 that is equivalent weight of calcium carbonate. So using this equation we have to solve this numerical. So 58.5 requires 50 gram of calcium carbonate. So therefore 3000 gram will require cross multiplication and this is the 2564.1 gram of calcium carbonate. Now this is the total calcium carbonate which can be treated. So total 4500 liters of water is passed. And in that 2564.1 gram of calcium carbonate was present. So therefore 1 liter contain so is equal to 0 0.569 gram of CaCO3 per liter. So this is the final answer. Therefore hardness of water is 569 ppm. Second type is completely exhausted zeolite softener requires 120 liter of NaCl solution having 1000 gram per liter of NaCl. How many liters of water having hardness 500 ppm can be softened by the softener? So first 1 liter consists of 100 gram of NaCl. Therefore 120 liter will consist of 12,000 gram of NaCl. Now we have to equate. So the equation is 58.5 gram of NaCl corresponds to 50 gram of calcium carbonate. Therefore 12,000 gram of NaCl corresponds to 10,256.41 gram of calcium carbonate.
So this will be the hardness that can be removed by zeolite softener. Now as we know that 500 ppm calcium carbonate equivalent is the hardness in 1 liter. Therefore 10,256.41 gram of calcium carbonate will be in 20,512.8 liters of water. In this problem we have to remember that we have to convert grams into milligrams because our final unit is in ppm. So ppm is milligram per liter. The third problem is the hardness of 1000 liter of sample of water consists of 341.9 ppm hardness was completely removed by passing it through zeolite softener. The zeolite softener was regenerated by passing sodium chloride solution containing 20 gram per liter of sodium chloride. How many liters of sodium chloride solution will be required to regenerate the zeolite softener? Now here the hardness is 341.9 ppm. ppm is nothing but milligram per liter so is equal to 341.9 milligram per liter. Now 1 liter consists of 341.9 ppm or milligram. So therefore 10,000 liter will be 3419 gram of calcium carbonate. Now we have to equate. 50 gram of calcium carbonate is equal to 58.5 gram of NaCl. So 3419 corresponds to 4023 gram of NaCl. Now it is given that 20 gram of NaCl is present in 1 liter. So 4,000.23 gram of NaCl will be present in 200.01 liters of NaCl solution. Next is demineralization or ion exchange process. First we have to see what are ion exchange resins. These are high molecular weight, cross-linked, insoluble, long chain organic polymers with microporous structure and the functional groups attached to the chain are responsible for ion exchange properties. What is the principle of ion exchange resins? Ion exchange resins are of two types, acidic resins and basic resins. Acidic resins consist of loosely held H plus ions and basic resins consist of loosely held OH minus ions. So H plus ions from acidic resins are exchanged for calcium or magnesium ions from hard water whereas OH minus ions from basic resins are exchanged for sulfate ions, chloride ions, nitrate ions etc. So H plus ions from cation exchange resin or acid resins and OH minus ions from basic resins or anion exchange resins combine with each other to form undissociated molecules of water. Let's see the diagram. Now this is the diagram for ion exchange process. In this case raw water is taken from the inlet at the top. This raw water is allowed to percolate through first cation exchange resin. Here the H plus ions which are loosely held are replaced for calcium and magnesium ions. The same water is allowed to percolate through anion exchange resin in the second column. As the same water passes through the anion exchange resin, here sulfate ions, chloride ions from the hard water are replaced by OH minus ions. So H plus ions from cation exchange resin and OH minus ion from anion exchange resin combine with each other to form undissociated molecules of water. Now still this water contains gases. So therefore it is allowed to pass through degasified unit where the water is heated at around 80 degrees Celsius and the gases are evacuated using vacuum pump. Finally the gases free deionized water is obtained. The reactions which take place during cation exchange resin and anion exchange resin are shown at the top. After some time the resin gets exhausted where the H, all the H plus ions and OH minus ions are completely replaced by chloride, calcium, magnesium etc ions. Hence it has to be regenerated. So for the regeneration purpose dilute HCl and dilute NaOH is added from the top. During this process calcium magnesium is replaced by H plus ions from the acids and we get RH2 that is cation exchange resin which is regenerated and in case of anion exchange resin the chlorine sulfate ions are replaced by OH minus ions and we get ROH twice which is anion exchange resin. So cation exchange resin and anion exchange resins are again ready to demineralize the water. Next is reverse osmosis method. Reverse osmosis is a pressure driven membrane separation process that separates dissolved and suspended substances from water. It removes all the solids, organic matter, pyrogens, colloidal matter, viruses, bacteria from water. The membrane acts as a selective barrier removing unwanted substances such as salt also and finally producing water safe for drinking. Reverse osmosis or RO. Before learning reverse osmosis, 
we have to understand what is meant by osmosis. Osmosis is the flow of solvent molecule through semi-permeable membrane from dilute concentration of solute to concentrated region. Whereas reverse osmosis is just the opposite to the osmosis where the solvent molecule is allowed to flow from concentrated region to dilute region of solute. In this case, the pressure is applied on the concentrated region and the solvent molecules are forced through semi-permeable membrane from concentrated region to dilute region of solute. So in the diagram, as you can see, the feed water is under pressure. So here around 15 to 40 kilogram per meter cube pressure is applied on the concentrated region. The solvent molecules are allowed to flow through the semi-permeable membrane. Semi-permeable membrane is made up of cellulose acetate or acetate rayon or polymethyl methacrylate. These are thin sheets which are bonded together and rolled in a spiral configuration around a plastic tube. This semi-permeable membrane allows only solvent molecule and not the solute molecules. But after some time what happens is the semi-permeable membrane gets blocked. Hence it is divided into two parts. One part is used for the purification purpose and the second part is used for the washing purpose. The rejected contaminants are removed from the waste stream to drain. The soft water is collected from the other tanks and finally it is passed through the storage tank. There are many advantages of RO. It removes all ionic as well as non-ionic colloidal high molecular weight organic matter. It removes colloidal silica which is not removed by demineralization. The maintenance cost is almost entirely the replacement of the semi-permeable membrane. When there is no more washing is possible, semi-permeable membrane or it is also called as filter is just replaced. The lifetime of membrane is around 2 years. The membrane can be replaced within few minutes. Due to the low capital cost, simplicity, low operating cost, high reliability, the reverse osmosis is gaining ground at present for converting sea water into drinking water. Apart from the purification of drinking water, RO can be mainly used in industry for recycling the waste water also. Next is biological oxygen demand. It is defined as the amount of free oxygen in water required for the biological oxidation of organic matter under aerobic conditions at 20 degrees Celsius for the period of 5 days. Unit is milligram per liter or ppm. If the maximum oxygen is consumed by the bacteria which, is, which are present in organic matter or sewage, then less oxygen will be left over for the water animals and it can be considered as water is polluted. The drinking water has less than 1 ppm of BOD whereas average sewage sample has 100 to 150 ppm of BOD value. It is determined using dissolved oxygen. This test is based on determination of dissolved oxygen content which is also called as back titration method. A known volume of sewage sample is diluted with a known volume of saline solution. A saline solution is the solution which contains nutrients for the growth of bacteria and also the dissolved oxygen for the same solution is predetermined. The whole solution is incubated at 20 degrees Celsius for 5 days because the growth of bacteria is maximum at 20 degrees Celsius. After 5 days, the unused oxygen is determined. Here, from the unused oxygen, we are determining the used oxygen. Therefore, it is called as back titration method. The difference between the original oxygen content in the saline solution and the unused oxygen which is left over gives the BOD value. What is the significance of BOD? BOD is the most important in sewage treatment as it indicates the amount of decomposable organic matter. Larger the BOD, larger is the pollution. This test has special significance for pollution control as it enables us to determine the degree of pollution. It is also mean for checking the quantity of effluents discharged into the surface water. Next is chemical oxygen demand. As we know that BOD consumes 5 days. Therefore, it can be done within 3 hours with the help of chemical oxygen demand. It is defined as amount of oxygen required for the chemical oxidation of organic matter in sewage as well as biologically inert matter. It is measure of both biologically oxidizable and biologically inert matter. So, COD value is always higher than the BOD. In case of BOD, it is only biologically oxidizable matter whereas in case of COD it is both biologically oxidizable and biologically inert matter. Let's see the determination. For the determination it is again back titration method. So in this case first we run a blank titration in which potassium dichromate is treated with ferrous ammonium sulphate. So we get reading which is called as blank titration reading. 
In the second titration, K2Cr2O7 and H2SO4 is mixed with the sewage sample for which the COD value is to be determined. The mixture of K2Cr2O7 and H2SO4 is the best oxidizing agent. It oxidizes all the biologically organic matter as well as biologically inert matter. The excess of K2Cr2O7 which is taken from that some K2Cr2O7 will be used for the oxidation of organic matter. Some part will remain. That remaining part is again titrated with ferrous ammonium sulphate. We will get some reading that is V2 which is also called as back titration reading. V1 minus V2 will give us the value of amount of K2Cr2O7 which is consumed or which is used for the oxidation of organic matter. So this value will be proportional to the COD value. Importance of COD. COD test finds significance in water pollution. COD determination gets completed in comparatively less time than the BOD determination. On the basis of COD value, approximate BOD value can be estimated. COD is an important and quickly measured parameter for stream, sewage and industrial waste sample to determine their pollution strength. It also helps in designing water treatment plant. Next is methods to control water pollution. The raw sewage which is passed into the water bodies. First it has to be passed through screening. Then sedimentation. Sedimentation is allowed to settle the precipitate. So for the settlement of precipitate, the alum or such coagulant is added. Then it can be treated via activated sludge method or trickling filter method. However, activated sludge method is widely used. Again it is treated for the sedimentation process, finally chlorination and then it is called as treated discharge. So th these are total anaerobic primary process and aerobic secondary process. Then we move to the activated sludge method. The wastewater effluent which is obtained after sedimentation is passed through the aeration tank. In the aeration tank, the if through the sample of sewage air is passed, then the oxidation of organic matter occurs. However, this process is very slow. This process can be fastened if the same process is carried out in the presence of sludge from the previous oxidation process. As this sludge contains numerous bacteria, therefore this sludge is called as activated sludge and the method is called as activated sludge method. The mixture is kept for 6 to 8 hours and the air is passed through the mixture. During this time, the aerobies present in the sludge carry out the oxidation of the organic matter. Then it is passed through the sedimentation tank. Finally, it is the effluent for the tertiary treatment. Now the sludge obtained after the oxidation process can be used as a fertilizer or it can be sent to the sludge digester and some part of the sludge is again sent to the aeration tank as written sludge for the fresh sample of sewage. Now the essentials of activated sludge method are at least 0.5 ppm oxygen must be present all the time. Oxygen is supplied either mechanical aeration or by diffused aeration system. The microorganisms should be provided with essential nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus which are supplied in the form of urea and mono or diammonium hydrogen phosphate. Optimum pH should be 6.5 to 9. Low temperature slows down the rate of metabolism while high temperature increases the metabolic activity to such an extent that the oxygen is consumed fast leading to the anaerobic conditions. Advantages of activated sludge process is the plant is very compact. Therefore, it produces a high quality effluent with relatively small areas. With this efficient system, at least 95% of the BOD removal is possible. This process is used in food processing, sugar, textile processing, antibiotic manufacturing industries, etc. The sludge obtained from this process is rich in microbial protein and has high nitrogen content. Hence, it can be used as a fertilizer. Sludge also contains vitamin B12 which can be recovered from it. There are only two disadvantages. It requires high cost of operation and maintenance and it needs careful attention. Next important part is removal of microorganisms. First method is addition of bleaching powder. This is a small scale method. Bleaching powder has a formula CaOCl2. When it is added to water, it forms CaOH twice and it produces a chlorine. This chlorine again reacts with water to give HCl and HOCl which is hypochlorous acid. As the hypochlorous acid is unstable, it is dissociated into HCl and nascent oxygen. This nascent oxygen deactivates the enzyme present in the microorganisms and hence the, it causes the death of microorganisms. Drawbacks of bleaching powder. 
Excess of bleaching powder imparts bad taste and smell to treated water. Thus, only calculated quantity must be added. Second, it is not stable, so it deteriorates due to continuous decomposition during storage. It introduces calcium in water and hence it increases the hardness. Second method is called as chlorination. This is most widely used. It has two inlets. From the one inlet, raw water is introduced and from the second, concentrated chlorine solution is introduced. These two are allowed to mix with one another with the help of baffle plates. The whole system is carried out high tower. The sterilized water is collected from an outlet at the bottom. The reaction is chlorine reacts with H2O to give HCl and hypochlorous acid. Hypochlorous acid dissociates into nascent oxygen which deactivates the enzyme and kills the bacteria. Factors affecting efficiency of chlorine are first is temperature. As the temperature increases, the efficiency also increases. Second is time of contact. Initially, the death rate is maximum. As the solution becomes more dilute, the death rate goes on decreasing. The pH of water also plays an important role. For better efficiency, the pH should be 6 to 8.5. Advantages are the use of chlorine is more effective and economical. It is stable, requires small space for storage and does not deteriorate on keeping. It can be used at high as well as low temperatures. It does not introduce any impurity in treated water. So chlorine is the most ideal disinfectant. The disadvantages are, if excess of chlorine is added, it produces bad taste and odor. Excessive chlorine produces irritation on mucous membrane. It is not effective at high pH values. Now we are moving to the best method for the removal of microorganisms that is ozonation. This is the diagram for the typical ozonation process. It has two inlets. One is for the raw water inlet and the second is for the ozone inlet. Ozone is produced by silent electric discharge with oxygen gas. So O3 that is the ozone is produced. This ozone is unstable so it deteriorates into O2 plus nascent oxygen. The nascent oxygen deactivates the enzyme and kills the bacteria. The raw water and ozone are allowed to mix with one another in a contact tank. Finally, the disinfected water is collected from an outlet at the top. It is most advantageous method as the disinfected water is colorless, odorless and tasteless. Process is very easy to operate. It has only one disadvantage that the method is very expensive. Desalination of brackish water. The water containing dissolved salt and having very salty taste is called as brackish water. Like the sea water and it is not suitable for drinking. So as per the demand, the brackish water also can be converted into drinking water. The process of removal of common salt from the brackish water is called as desalination. This is the line diagram of electrodialysis. The sea water is introduced from the inlet at the top. Then there are two electrodes. At one side there is cathode which is negative electrode and at the other side there is positive electrode which is called as anode. When the electric current is applied between the two electrodes, the negative ion moves towards the positive electrode and positive ion moves towards the negative electrode. Thus, concentration of brackish water decreases in the central compartment whereas it increases in the side compartment. Pure water is collected from the central compartment and concentrated brine solution is collected from the side compartments. This process can be improved by selection of ion selective membranes. Ion selective membranes are of two types, cation selective membrane and anion selective membranes. These are arranged alternatively. First, the seawater is introduced into the electrodialytic cell. There are two types of electrodes, cathode and anode. When the current is applied, positive ions move towards the negative electrode that is cathode and negative ions move to the positive electrode. The cation selective membranes allows only cations to pass and anion selective membranes allows only anions to pass. Therefore, finally, we get alternate streams of pure water and concentrated seawater which are collected from the outlets at the bottom. These are the common specifications of potable water. Thanks for watching. If you like, click subscribe for more such videos.